Okay, so we can start. And today is July 13th, okay, 2024. So we'll begin with the salutation. First, we can do three bows to the Buddha. One, two, three. And then we'll do the <clears throat> we'll do the salutation. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Homage to the blessed one, the worthy one, the fully enlightened one. <clears throat> Okay, so we'll be continuing now in our reading of the Anguttara Nikaya, the numerical discourses. We're in the book of the sixes. And now we're going to come to two suttas, similar in some respects, dealing with the question of how the Dhamma is directly visible. And the Pali word that's translated, well, let's go, come to the text itself. Okay, so here a wanderer by the name of Molia Sivaka comes to the Blessed One, the Buddha. And since he's not a Buddhist, he doesn't pay homage to the Buddha, but instead they exchange greetings, cordial greetings. And then he sits down and he's going to ask a question. Actually, it's interesting that according to the text, he refers to the Buddha as Bhante. Even though he's exchanged, I just noticed this, he's exchanged greetings with the Buddha. Usually when somebody is not a Buddhist, not a Buddhist disciple, and they exchange greetings with the Buddha, then they'll refer to the Buddha as Bo Gotama, the Honorable Gotama, rather than Bhante. So it's a little puzzling. Bhante it will be the followers of the Buddha that call the Buddha Bhante. But anyway, that's just a rather secondary matter. So this wanderer named Molia Sivaka, apparently he's heard a statement about the Dhamma that is used to describe the Buddha's teaching. And the statement goes, directly visible Dhamma, directly visible Dhamma. And so the Pali expression here is, Sanditiko Dhammo. And this, those of you who join us on Wednesday evening for the Wednesday meditation will know that when we do the chanting of homage to the Dhamma, we always come across this phrase, Sanditiko Dhammo, Swakato Bhagavata Dhamma, Swakato Bhagavata Dhammo, Sanditiko. And sanditiko is based on the verb dasati, which means to see. So it means something that can be seen, that can be seen directly. And then Sivaka, Molia Sivaka, expands on his, or formulates his question by using almost the full formula in praise of the Dhamma. So he says, in what way is the Dhamma directly visible, sanditiko. Then the next word is akaliko. Which is based on the word kala, that means time. And so kaliko is something pertaining to time. And the way it's usually used is something that takes time to bring its benefits. So akaliko means something that brings immediate benefit. You don't have to wait for a long time, but as soon as you put it into serious practice, you start to experience to gain the benefits. Then it is described as ehi pasiko, which is what we translate inviting to come and see. And this Pali word is based on two 
imperatives, grammatically we call these imperatives, whoops, ehi, which means come, like a command, and pasa, another command, see. So literally it's simply come and see, as though it's giving a command. But we translate it in a little more polite way, inviting one to come and see. So it's saying, come and see me. Just like a little bit like in Alice in Wonderland, I think when Alice falls through the hole under which the hair went, then she finds herself in this cave and there's a bottle that says, drink me. <laughs> so it's giving the bottle is giving the command. And so the Dhamma is in a sense giving the command, come and see. In other words, put it into practice, put me into practice and see that you get the benefits. And then it's open ayako. which is based on the verb upaneti, which means to be applied. And especially, it's sometimes described as ajatang, if I remember, pachatang upaneti, to be applied to oneself. In other words, to be brought close to oneself. And then the last phrase is Pachatang Vedi Tabo Vinyu He Pachatang Vedi Tabo Vinyu He. So Pachatang means personally and Vedi Tabo means to be experienced, to be understood, to be realized. Vinyu He by the wise. So this is the classical formulation of the praise to the Dhamma. So the Dhamma is something which is directly visible, something that we are to see for ourselves. It's something that is immediate, that brings immediate benefits, something that is calling out to us and saying, come and see it for yourself, test it out and see, see how it works. Open Nayako with something that we are to apply to ourselves. And when we apply it, then we can realize it, understand it, and experience it if we are wise. So hopefully we are wise enough to be able to gain at least a little bit of experiential benefit from the Dhamma. Okay, so now the Buddha is going to give his question, his reply to Sivika's question. And he does give a reply by asking some questions. It's a kind of way of turning the question back on the investigator, on the person who asked the question. So he says, I will question you in turn. You answer as you see fit. And then he says, when there is greed within you, do you know there is greed within me? When there is no greed within you, do you know there is no greed within you? And the answer is yes. And so the Buddha says, now, since when there is greed within you, you know there is greed within you. When there is no greed within you, you know there is no greed within, within me. In this way, the Dhamma is directly visible, immediate, inviting one to come and see, applicable to be personally experienced by the wise. Yeah, let's run through the whole thing and then we'll come back and try to draw out the implications of this. So first, question relates, or a pair, of, a pair of questions relates to the presence or absence of greed, loba. 
Next question relates to hatred. Third pair of questions relates to delusion. So you could see right here that the text has covered the three unwholesome roots, and in a way that's almost sufficient in itself. And so with that, we could have put the sutta in the book of threes, but then the text, it seems a little bit to me artificial, almost as though the compilers have added three more questions in order to have some material to put in the book of sixes. So the Pali word is Loba Dhamma, and then just below Dosa Dhamma, Moha Dhamma. So these would be states connected with greed, and Dosa Dhamma will be states connected with hatred, Moha Dhamma states connected with delusion. And so what do you think when there are states connected with greed within you, states connected with hatred within you, states connected with delusion within you? Do you know there is a state connected with delusion? And when there is no state connected with delusion, do you know there is no state connected with delusion? And so maybe if we want to maybe um, explicate this, we could say states connected with greed. So these would be terms maybe that occur in Pali in the suttas, and we have English counterparts that are not exactly the same as greed, but sort of overlap with it or have represent various shades of greed. For example, we could say lust, craving, covetousness, attachment, clinging, um, even pride, conceit. We could say that those are states connected with greed, selfishness, miserliness, states that are strongly connected with greed, states connected with hatred. Yeah, here we could say anger, um, violence, irritation, annoyance, ferocity. What are some others that I might be missing? Any suggestions? Ill will? Yeah, Ill that's will. a good one. Ill will. Anything else? Torture. Say again. Torture. Torture? Maybe say again. Torture someone? Torturing. I say torture is an action, but maybe it points to something, cruelty, we could say. Jealousy. How about bitterness? Wait, I just heard two almost at the same time. One was a- Jealousy? Jealousy. Yeah, we could say jealousy is connected with, with hatred. And then there was another one, now voice. How about bitterness? Bitterness? Was that bitterness? Yes. Yeah, okay. Okay, so I think we get the idea. We don't have to compile this encyclopedia of hatred. States connected with delusion. So I would say, offering some examples, I would say wrong view. Even though in the Abhidhamma, wrong view is connected, strangely, with greed. But in my opinion, a uh, wrong view is maybe more closely connected with delusion. Some other states, qualities connected with delusion.
egoism. Yeah, I would say egotism. And conceit, confusion. We say again. Conceit, conceit. Fancy. Conceit. 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 Yeah. Yeah, I would say conceit is connected with delusion. Again, according to the Abhidhamma system, conceit is connected with greed, or they say it's rooted in greed. But in my opinion, conceit has more strongly the overtones or a stronger connection with delusion. Yeah, there's also another, actually two other states that are explicitly connected in the Abhidhamma with delusion. If somebody knows the Abhidhamma system, they should be able to guess. Ignorance? Well, ignorance is just another word for delusion. Doubt? Yeah, that is one of them. Doubt. So that's uncertainty. So you don't have insight, you don't have knowledge, you don't have understanding. And so when you're confronted with something, particularly with teachings from the Dhamma, then one experiences doubt. The next one is more subtle. And unless you really know the Abhidhamma, you might not be able to guess what it is. Arrogant? Would it be faith, Sadda, Bhante? Sadda. Restlessness. Yeah. I heard it. Restlessness. Right, it's restlessness, udacha. So you, you, you don't see the connection between restlessness and delusion or ignorance so clearly as in the case of wrong views or doubt. But according to the sort of Abhidhamma teaching, as long as there is some trace of delusion or ignorance, even a subtle residue of ignorance in the mind, there is some degree of a very, very subtle current of mental agitation or restlessness present. That's udacha. Okay, so now we've gone through the six sort of um, list of six things to be investigated to determine whether they're present in oneself or absent. So greed, present or absent. Hatred, present or absent. Delusion, present or absent. States connected with greed, states connected with or offshoots of hatred, states connected with delusion, offshoots, states, offshoots of delusion. So when you know that any of these is present, what's interesting is the first, just taking the first alternative. So when there is greed within you, you know there's greed within you. When no greed within you, you know there is no greed within you. In that way, the Dhamma is directly visible, immediate, something that invites to see and so forth. So even, you know, you think that to realize the Dhamma means you have to have some profound breakthrough, some deep penetration to the ultimate, supreme, unconditioned, deathless, liberating truth. But even when there's greed, hatred, and delusion within us, when we look within ourselves and we recognize that there are these states present within us, even to that extent, we could say, the Dhamma becomes directly visible. So we're starting to see into the truth of the Dhamma just by recognizing what is taking place within our own mind. And let's go over to, on to the next sutta, which is very similar. So here we have a certain Brahmin ap approaches the Buddha and again, exchange greetings. Obviously, then he's not a disciple of the Buddha. And here in the typical way, he addresses the Buddha as Bo Gotama, the master Gotama. Not he, that he's taking the Buddha as his own master. 
It's just a polite form like Honorable Gotama. Again, he has heard the same description of the Dhamma and he asks, in what way is that the case? Okay, so here the Buddha again uses the same type of method of interrogation, but here he uses lust rather than greed, but basically it's referring to the same thing. So we have lust, again, hatred and delusion. But now we have the next three factors are a bit different. So we have kaya sandosa, I think is the expression. Kaya sandosang, vachi sandosang, mano sandosang. So these would be faulty qualities of body, speech, and mind. So probably this is referring to committing some kind of transgressive action of the body, or maybe a disposition to, cre to engage in some kind of bodily transgression. And in terms of the 10 courses of wholesome action, this would be, or unwholesome action, this would be maybe the impulse, the intention, the volition to kill, take life, to steal, and to engage in sexual misconduct. Those would be the three primary examples. And there can be many, many other minor transgressions committed through the body. Then the intention or the impulse to commit some kind of verbal transgression, that would be the impulse to speak falsely or to lie, to commit slander or divisive speech, to utter angry or harsh speech, and to indulge in gossip. So those would be the verbal faults. Already, since you're looking within yourself, so this is, I think, looking at this not so much in terms of bodily or verbal action as such, but as the intention starting to take shape within the mind to commit any of those transgressions. And then the mental fault would be simply mental states governed by greed, hatred, and delusion. The primary examples in the list of unwholesome actions would be covetousness, the desire to get hold of the possessions of others, ill will, which means a very strong impulse to, or strong desire for others to meet with some kind of misfortune or suffering. And then the last would be wrong view, the wrong view that denies the validity of moral distinctions and that denies the operation of karma and its fruit. So those would be bodily faults, verbal faults, and mental faults. So again, when any of these arise within you, then you know when it's present, you know that it's present. When it's absent, you know that it is absent. And so in this way, the Dhamma is said to be directly visible, immediate, inviting one to come and see, and so forth. Yeah, then I wanted to go to the notes that I prepared, which I think helped to shed some light on the meaning or the implications of these. Let us find them. Okay. Yeah, these suttas that we've just come across have some counterparts in the Anguttara Nikaya, also in the Anguttara Nikaya, but in the Book of Threes. And so here we have a sutta. Interestingly, it's each case, it's somebody who is a non-Buddhist 
who comes to the Buddha and asks about the meaning of this expression, not a direct disciple of the Buddha. Okay, so here the Brahmin comes and asks the same question, how is the Dhamma directly visible and so forth? And now the Buddha says here, okay, one who is excited by lust, overcome by lust, obsessed by lust, intends for his own harm, for the harm of others, for the harm of both, and he experiences mental suffering and dejection. But when lust is abandoned, then one doesn't intend for the, one's own harm, for the harm of others, for the harm of both, and one doesn't experience mental suffering and dejection. In that way, the Dhamma is directly visible. And the same is said with regard to hatred and again with regard to delusion. And so in this case, you could see more clearly, though, this brings out more clearly how the Dhamma is directly visible, that when you overcome even temporarily lust, hatred, and delusion, when you bring them under control, when you regulate them, that will have its kind of transformative effect on one's dispositions to actions, so that one doesn't intend or one doesn't plan or act in ways that will bounce back and bring harm to yourself, harm to others, harm to both. And also important point made in this sutta is even quite apart from the impact on one's actions, but even when lust, hatred, and delusion arise, then one experiences Dukkha Domanasa. I think it's Chaitasika Dukkha Domanasa, mental pain and dejection, mental suffering and dejection. So from this perspective, when lust, hate, and delusion arise, they bring along with them, inevitably, they're accompanied by some degree of suffering and displeasure, some kind of maybe inner stress, anguish, tension. Even though, I mean, you look out in the world as a whole, and sort of the premise that governs most people's ways of thinking is that when you get, that you deliberately excite lust, especially sensual lust or sexual desire, because then when you satisfy that lust, that desire, that brings pleasure and happiness. So that is why we have you know, all sorts of sensually enticing goods are promoted you know, in the shops, on the internet. So we have beautiful clothes, um, perfumes, makeup, and the men go to the gym in order to exercise their body so they become strong and powerful to make impression on, on the young women. So we operate with the assumption that stimulating lust in oneself and in others will bring happiness to yourself and others but in the long run, from the Buddha's perspective, it brings suffering, dejection, disappointment. Also, even with hatred, of course, people don't want to be driven or overcome and obsessed by hatred, but naturally hatred arises when you meet disagreeable situations or disagreeable antagonistic people. And so you think that when you release your hatred, 
by seeking vengeance, retribution on others, especially if others have offended you in any way, insulted you, have got competing with you, then you want to obliterate them, to eliminate them, to vanquish them. And that is the expression of hatred. And then you think by triumphing over others or by defeating them in the competition that you will experience pleasure and happiness. <clears throat> but what is the eventual outcome for yourself and others? Any thoughts? Some form of sadness. It brings sadness? <clears throat> disappointment. Yeah, we could say disappointment, sadness, and- Frustration. Frustration. And Frustration. Frustration, yeah, that's very good. Especially if the other person vanquishes you, if you're competing with somebody else, and they overcome you, then you feel real disappointment, frustration. And when they triumph over you, what else do you experience? Could it be hatred, Dante? Yeah, you feel stronger hatred. Anger? Despair. Anger and despair, yeah. And then there comes the desire for vengeance. And so whenever you brood upon the defeat that you've experienced at the hands of others, even if it's very subtle form, now they have the expression microaggressions. So if somebody displays a microaggression to you and you don't, you're not able to retaliate by displaying a microaggression against the other person, then that thought sort of simmers in the mind, it brews in the mind, and then you feel more anger or dejection, or maybe you have a sense of defeat. Yeah, that's what we get in the second verse of the Dhammapada. He, how does it go? He defeated me, he beat me, he arrest, harassed me, he vanquished me. Those who harbor such thoughts do not overcome their hatred. Something like that. Okay, then we have the next sutta in this series. Again, this is in the threes. So here we have a wanderer comes to the Buddha and asks how the Dhamma is directly visible. And then the Buddha answers, here one excited by lust and so forth, intends for his own harm, the harm of others, the harm of both, experiences mental suffering and dejection. And then when, so this is the same as in the previous sutta. But then there are three parts for each of these defilements. So when one is overcome by lust, then one engages in misconduct by body, speech, and mind. But when lust is abandoned, then one doesn't engage in misconduct by body, speech, and mind. And then the third aspect, one excited by lust, overcome by lust, does not understand as it really is his own good the good of others or the good of both. But when lust is abandoned, then one understands one's own good, the good of others and the good of both. So in that way, the Dhamma is directly visible. And then the same thing applies with hatred and delusion. And what I find interesting about these suttas, all of these suttas that we've just run through, both the version in the Book of Sixes and the version in the Book of Threes, 
is that the person, the people who ask the questions are not the disciples of the Buddha. So we have wanderer, in one case a wanderer, in the other cases they're Brahmins. And so it seems to me, this is my hypothesis, that the Buddha, you see, is not teaching them the Four Noble Truths, not teaching them dependent origination, not teaching them anatta or non-self or the three characteristics, impermanence, suffering, and non-self. Because the Buddha reserves those teachings as a general rule, reserves those teachings for those who have already placed confidence in him as the teacher, as their teacher. So it seems to me that what the Buddha is doing here is proceeding in a way that we might call skillful means. And the skillful means is sort of indirectly to move them in the direction of the final goal of his teaching. So the final goal is Nibbana. And one of the ways of defining Nibbana is the destruction of lust, destruction of hatred, and the destruction of delusion. Ragakayo, dosakayo, mohakayo. So you find that the definition of Nibbana in the Sangyutta Nikaya, particularly in the Sangyutta Nikaya, in chapter 40, 43, there's a whole series of suttas on the unconditioned. What is the unconditioned? The asankata datu, the unconditioned element. It is the destruction of lust, destruction of hatred, and destruction of delusion. And that sort of direct pointing to Nibbana is intended for those who have that trust in the Buddha as their teacher. But now, the, in this case, we have people coming to question the Buddha who haven't placed that confidence in him. And so the Buddha is using this kind of indirect means to lead them to the, to, or to point in the direction of the goal by something, by using a standard, a criterion, or a method of practice that they can apply directly. So you don't have to place trust in the Buddha. Don't have to say, I take refuge in the Buddha, I take refuge in the Dhamma, I take refuge in the Sangha. But you have here a very, very simple, very basic formulation. You look into your own mind and you see when there is lust or greed present, or any of their offshoots, craving, attachment, um, clinging, um, or, or any of the offshoots of lust or greed, you look and you see, how does that affect your immediate feeling? Does it bring along some degree of mental suffering and dejection, or does it bring pleasure and happiness when the mind is overcome by lust, hatred, and delusion? And so you could see just by direct investigation, even though it might seem to bring, to open the opportunities for pleasure when you indulge that lust, when you release that anger and hatred, when you remain sort of drifting in this mire, the swamp of delusion, you seem to be 
in the swamp of delusion, you seem to be drifting in comfort and security. But if you really look honestly at the impact of that on your mind, you see it brings along some degree of suffering and dejection, some kind of displeasure, underlying current of displeasure. And then you inquire, how do these states, lust, hatred, and delusion, what is their impact on the way you prepare for your actions? How does it affect your actions? Do they lead to actions that will be harmful to yourself or beneficial to yourself? Harmful to others benefit or beneficial to others? Harmful or beneficial to both oneself and others? And then if you examine the consequences of lust, hatred, and delusion, honestly and candidly and with some degree of wisdom, you see that they lead to your harm and the harm of others. And then when I found another passage, I found rather interesting. Actually, we have here, yeah, a sutta where a Brahmin comes to the Buddha and then says that Nibbana is directly visible. Nibbana is said to be directly visible. In what way is Nibbana directly visible? And here the Buddha uses the same method of responding. He says that when one is excited by lust, that leads to one's harm, the harm of others and so forth. But when lust is abandoned, when hatred is abandoned, when delusion is abandoned, one does not intend for one's own harm, the harm of others or the harm of both. And one doesn't experience inner suffering and dejection. In that way, Nibbana is directly visible. But I think that this particular teaching has to be taken a little bit metaphorically. It doesn't mean that when you abandon temporarily just through some kind of mental meditative practice, temporarily you overcome lust, hatred, and delusion. It doesn't mean that that is actually Nibbana, but we could say that when we temporarily abandon lust, hatred, and delusion through any kind of skillful application of meditation practices or insight practices, we can say that that is a temporary extinguishing of lust, hatred, and delusion. And the literal meaning of Nibbana is extinguishing, the going out of a fire. And so when we, even temporarily, we overcome lust, hate, and delusion, when we experience some kind of inner tranquility or peace, even through samadhi, through concentration, that is not a real Nibbana, not the ultimate unconditioned Nibbana, but it's a temper, it, it can be called a directly visible Nibbana in that it is an experiential, ex, even if temporary, extinguishing of lust, hatred, and delusion. But I wanted to come to another passage, and this is the passage in the Satipatthana Sutta, which has an interesting connection with these suttas we've just been looking at. And this is in the contemplation of mind, the Chitanupassana. Okay, so here the Buddha is explaining how the practitioner dwells Chite Chitanu Pasi Viharati, how he dwells contemplating the mind in the mind. And the text goes here, one knows a mind with lust as a mind with lust. 
and the mind without lust is a mind without lust, then the mind with hatred as the mind with hatred, and similarly the mind without hatred, one knows the mind with delusion as a mind with delusion, and a mind without delusion as a mind without delusion. Yeah, we don't need the, the others. But the important point here is that part of the practice in developing satipatthana, the contemplation of the mind, is when lust, hatred, and delusion arise, you don't have to think that my meditation practice is destroyed or my meditation practice is a failure. When these states arise with lust, hatred, and delusion, sort of without this tool of mindfulness, without this tool of bhavana, of meditative practice, we usually just let ourselves be swept along by the currents, by the force, by the impulses of lust and hatred, or we just sink in the swamp of delusion. But when we have this tool of mindfulness practice, we turn back upon the mind and watch the mind itself, and we know what is, has arisen in the mind, and we label it and identify it, and that very act of labeling, designating, and identifying the states of mind, even the states that are defilements, are steps in the path, in the process of overcoming them. So what I found in myself to be very, very useful <laughs> when states, okay, of lust, they can arise, or states of anger or hatred or disappointment can arise, states of frustration, any kind of negative state, states of worry or fear can arise. What one does, instead of letting oneself be overwhelmed by them, is simply to put them under observation and when you put them under observation, sort of you separate the observing portion of the mind from the active portion of the mind, the portion of the mind that is under the domination of that defilement, what happens is that def that defilement or that unwholesome state or that disturbing state becomes weaker, starts to fade away, and then gets broken off. And so what I say is that we have, okay, we call this the mind, and we distinguish in the mind two portions. The objective portion, the observed, and the subject, subjective portion, the observation or the observing portion. And so you're watching the mind. And so here we have what is watching the mind? It's the mind itself. So the mind is watching the mind. You're looking internally to see what is happening in the mind. And as you're watching the mind in the objective portion, let us say lust arises, hatred or anger, delusion. And we could put any other things that are not explicitly mentioned worry, fear, anxiety, stress, 
What are some other disagreeable states, qualities that might disturb the mind? Ill will. Again? Ill will. Well, ill will, we could say, belongs with hatred or anger. How about depression? Okay, that's a good one. And I don't want to say that meditation practice is a complete remedy for depression. I think there can be kinds of clinical forms of depression for which one might need medical, uh, medical consultation and treatment. But let us say, to avoid the implications of depression, let's say moods of dejection, Anything else? Maybe we'll just take one more. Irritability. Irritability. Irritability is in a way connected to a sort of a mode of, of hatred. Did you have a suggestion? Intoxication. Intoxication. Not in the sense of having used the liquor. Yes. <laughs> well, this is somebody who's in meditation practice. I would assume that they're not getting intoxicated. Yeah, but let us maybe take. Read. No. How about a, addiction? Again? Addiction. Addiction. Okay, addiction is an objective state. But yeah, I would say like addiction sort of subjectively is a manifestation of craving, which is roughly synonymous with raga, form of raga. Of course, lust is a rather, in English, it's a limited rendering of the Pali word raga, which has very broad implications. Okay, I think we have enough examples here to work with. What about regret, Bhante? Regret, actually, that's a good one. And disappointment in yourself for um, say, behaving not as well as you'd want to. <laughs> okay. <laughs> self, that's called self-depreciation. Okay, so we, I think we have enough examples. So th there can be many others, but you could just fill them in. So these things arise. You say that the mind is overcome by them, overrun by them, but they're arising in the objective portion of the mind. And normally, the subjective portion and the objective portion are sort of merged together. So we become victimized by the workings of our own mind, because we're not able to make this division in the mind. But what we're doing with the, when we take up the meditation practice, particularly this practice of citta contemplation of the mind, is that we are making this distinction or a kind of fission in the mind between the objective portion and the subjective portion. So these, all of these states, we find are occurring when we make this di distinction or bifurcation in the mind, all of these states are occurring in the objective portion, which is now being subjected to observation. And we then have the subjective portion of the mind And what is taking place in the objective portion? What is the subjective portion doing? Observation. I'm not getting it. Taking it personally. No. Awareness. Exactly. Exactly. That's one word we could use. Awareness. Another word? Could it be to detach, Mind. Be detach from the feeling itself, from the emotion? I just want one word. Oh. No. 
Noting. Say again. Observing. Observing. Alert. Witnessing. He, wait, wait, one person at a time. Diverse voices are merging. Mindfulness. Okay, being mindful. So Acknowledging. Being aware, being mindful. Attending. Attending. Knowing. Knowing. And there's not, one more word. Realization. The word is should be staring you in the face. Realization. Observing. Observing. Realization. That's exactly the word. That's why I say it's staring you in the face. It's right on the screen. <laughs> so observing. I like the word observing the best. So if let us say worry has arisen or stress, anxiety. So if we don't have this tool of mindfulness, we get overwhelmed and crushed by worry, fear, stress, anxiety, dejection, regret, self-denigration, depreciation. Actually, denigration is maybe a good, better word. But when these states arise, we have this very precious, valuable tool, which is being aware, being mindful, looking at the working of the mind. And when you look at the working of the mind, it's like you're putting that state, whether it's worry, fear, stress, and so on, under observation, you're watching it, and you just see it arise in the mind and you know that it is just a mental state. Normally, when we don't make this division in the mind, because of the strength of the self-delusion, we identify with these states. We take them to be mine or I. This is what I am. I am this, I am that. That's what I am. So I'm a fearful person, an anxious person. I'm a, always stressed. Or I have this dejection, self-denigration. I'm worthless, value, value, I have no value good for nothing. But now you go back into the observing portion and just you drop, whether you're doing the breath or bodily sensations, whatever, you put that aside and you just watch the mind and see what is occurring and just recognize these are mental states and what happens to these mental states when you observe them? We Atamayata. What is that? Atamayata. Atamayata. Not to recognize in them as a part of oneself, not a, as oneself. Okay, the simplest thing, the simplest, the first observation about these mental states. Anicca. Exactly, anicca, that they arise and they fall away. And because they arise and fall away, you know that they are not me, not what I am. And in this way, you can reduce their grip on the mind until you experience those states in which there's no worry, no fear, no craving, no stress, dejection, and so forth. Sort of you sort of move back from the observed portion into the subjective portion 
until those disturbing states fall away and what becomes more prominent is this awareness, mindfulness, knowing, observing, which leads to a kind of, maybe a kind of brightness of the mind. And that brightness will then be often be accompanied by joy, elation, tranquility, etc. Okay, so that is not yet Nibbana. Don't think that that is Nibbana. But this yeah. is a kind of temporary opening which will then pave the way for the deepening of mindfulness and concentration. Okay, I think maybe we can, I just wanted to leave some time for questions. And so the way to ask the question is to use the hand symbol. Let me get the participant list. Okay, I take them in the order in which I find them. So the first one is from Ali. Yes, sir. Yeah. Thank you, Mate. Uh, for, so uh, I've been uh, struggling with letting go. So are, can these be uh, the, the Yeah, objective? I'm not getting the sound so clearly. Let me see if... Oh, I'm sorry. Can... Yeah, can you hear me now, Bonte? I can. The volume is okay, but the sound quality is not so good. Okay. We have, I'm sorry. We have... Wait, that, I uh, think I have in my bag. I think I have a headphone. Let me get that. Uh, I can get a mic also. Oh, I see Jason has. Okay, let us try these. Uh, hello? No. Okay, you could go now. Uh, hello, Monte. Yes. Oh. Okay, it's not coming into the headphones. Okay. Okay, try again. Oh, okay. Hello, Monte. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear. The volume is okay. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, I've been struggling with the uh, points of letting go, uh, which is the big part of practice for me. Yeah. And then there's steps, the steps that you would just like outline with uh, subjective and objective mind. Once I start observing it, would that be part of the letting go process that, you know, it's hugely talked about in the practice? Yeah, exactly. You don't have to think or make a deliberate effort let, to let go, let go, but just move from into the observing portion and just watch the disturbing state. And then it should start to lose its strength, its power, until it drops away and then it sort of fades out by itself rather than of course you could make a deliberate effort to let go but sometimes that doesn't work for everybody so some there are different methods sometimes you could use like a forceful letting go but what i find what i found to be the most effective way is this sort of gentle simple observation Okay, and eventually the mind lets go. Yeah, exactly. Thank you very much, Bhante. Thank you. Okay, I think the next, let me just see the list. Okay, the next one is Samangi, Samangi Munasinga. Yes, Bhante, thank you. In the very, this is on the, uh, um, on the screen right now, Anicca arise and they fall away, and you say, it's not me. 
So what is me? How do you um, um, identify the me to say no? No, in, in the practice of, of, of Dhamma, we don't search for a me, for an I, for a self. But when we're doing this contemplation with insight, whatever arises, we recognize to be a Nietzsche, to be impermanent. We see it arising and falling away. And with that, we don't identify with it. We just realize this is not me. And even the observing portion, you know, there's a tendency, maybe this is what happens in the Brahminic system, is to take that the observed portion is not self, but the awareness then becomes identified. Hi becomes identified as the Atman, as the self. But from the Buddha's point of view, this is where the Buddha breaks away from the Vedantic systems. Even that awareness, one turns back upon it and sees that even that awareness arises and falls away. So even awareness is not me, <coughs> not, me not myself. Okay, thank okay, you. Okay, we'll just move on to now, um, this is Vandana. Thank you, Bhante. Yes, uh, I just want to make a comment on what Buddha said to the Brahmin and the other person about if the lust is in you, you know it is in me, and it is not. So I'm just wondering, because of the delusion, you can't see your negative states, right? That's why you act upon them. So is it the delusion has to be the root of everything? Is delusion what? Delusion is the root of uh, everything because because of that we we think that sensual pleasures are good and yeah. Yeah. lust is good. So the delusion has to be. And now I'm also wondering that in Sanskrit the moha means this kind of uh, connected with more like attached to something uh, by ignorance without uh, looking at the uh, right or wrong side, but just being uh, blind by something. So that's, that's my uh, understanding. And uh, yeah, yeah, delusion is in a way you could say is the, mo the most of the three It's the most difficult to recognize. Because delusion is what, um, you know, what blinds us, and what sort of covers and conceals the mind. But I, what I would say is that at least we can begin by recognizing the more visible manifestations of delusion. These would be wrong views and doubt and even this uh, agitation or restlessness we can see as manifestation of delusion. And for that, a person needs to be very calm and mindful. Yeah, exactly. That is why it takes the concentrated mind or panya for wisdom to arise and it's wisdom that eradicates delusion. Yeah, so that's what I, I, I was just wanted to say that that's why it's not dhamma is not visible for everyone because people who are deluded or not practicing it's very hard for them to see their own exactly yeah yeah yeah. yeah. So, do you also think that's the meta metacognition? The word in psychology is connected to the contemplation of mind. Metacognition, thinking about your thinking. Metacognition. I I don't know the expression. Okay. It makes sense. Similar. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but Thank I don't you. know how it's used. Okay, we just have time for one more question. This will be Alex W. Hi. Thank you, Bonte. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, I could hear you. Okay. Okay. Um, I'll try to keep my question short. My question is about uh, the states of mind connected with hatred. I'm wondering if the teachings have any advice on um, dealing with a kind of righteous seeming sort of anger. Uh, to, to give a very short anecdote, uh, I, I live by the water and some of my neighbors were fishing and they had some children with them. Um, and I noticed that there was lots of dead fish just sort of floating in the water. They were They were catching the fish and killing them and not really eating them, but just sort of killing them and throwing the corpses in the water and it, it made um you know these feelings of like anger come up in me and so it was sort of an obstacle for me at, um and so i was wondering if you had any advice for 
um, dealing with those kinds of situations or feelings? Um, yeah, sometimes one just has to In situations like that, sometimes you have to determine whether it will be fruitful to speak to the people or whether it's safer just to mind your own business and to sort of deal with the, what you call the righteous anger within oneself. Um, if you think that the people are persuadable, then you can speak to them and try to convince them that <laughs> Of course, they need some kind of compassion, inherent compassion to respond to this, that the fish are also living beings. And if they are catching the fish to eat them, of course, I won't try to argue against fishermen who depend on fishing for their living. But if they're just doing this for entertainment, try to persuade them that to respect the lives of the fish. But say, if you decide not it might sometimes it's safer not to engage in those kind of arguments then you just have to i would say to recognize that this is a kind of natural i would say almost that that kind of righteous what you call a righteous anger is a kind of natural expression of compassion in a situation where you don't have the opportunity to act on the basis of that compassion so recognize that the compassion is good but that you just have to sort of accept that this is the way things are, the situation that there's really nothing that can be done to transform it. Okay, I think we're going to have to end now because I will have to go up for the meal. And so we'll end with the sharing of the merits. And so we're going to share the merits of our meditation, of our um, Dhamma teaching and discussion, we share the merits with the Dhamma protecting Devas, the Nagas, and with all beings. Akasa ta jabuma ta deva naga mahidi ka panyanta manumoditva chirang ra kantu sasanam. Akasa ta jabuma ta Deva Naga Mahidika Panyanta Manumoditva Chirangra Kantu Desanam Akasa Ta Chabumata Deva Naga Mahidika Panyanta Manumoditva Chirangra Kantu Mang Parang Tuka Pata Janiduka Baya patachani baya, soka patachani soka, unto sabe pipani no. May those in suffering be free from suffering. May those in fear be free from fear. May those in sorrow be free from sorrow. May all living beings also, <coughs> also be thus. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Okay, before we end, yeah, before we end, I want to mention that um, over the Labor Day weekend, I'll be giving here at Twangyan Monastery a retreat from Friday evening through noon on Tuesday on the Buddha's teachings for lay people. And so if you're able to come in person to the monastery, then you can come. But there are only 50 places available for outside participants. So if you're interested to come, you should register soon and only register if you definitely can come. Will it be online too, Bhante? It will be online. So those who cannot come can register to attend online thank you there should be a panel will be available if you go to the website of baus that's the buddhist association of the united states you'll see two registration forms one for online registration and the other is for on-site registration thank you bante thank you bante thank you bante
Thank you, Bhante. Thank you, Bhante. Enjoy Thank your you. Thank we're going you, to end. Wait, we're That's going to do nice. three bows. We're going to do three bows to the Buddha. Okay, so thank you all for joining today. Thank you. Thank you, Bante. 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 Very beneficial. Thank you, Bante. Thank you, Bante. Thank you, Bante. Thank you very much. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Have a good meal, Bante. Thank you, Bante. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Okay, so I'm going to stop the share. Thank you, Bante. Stop the recording.